Um, I'm Katie Sorensen, um, Director of Outreach and Communications here at the Center for Art and Wood. And I wanna welcome all of you to Object Lesson. Um, this is a monthly First Friday speaker, First Friday speaker series um, that opens wide the Center's museum collection um, through the perspectives of individuals um, throughout our community. Um, and tonight uh, we have a friend of the center joining us. Uh, but before that, I would like to also acknowledge that the center is located on the land of the Lenape um, people. And if you wanna learn more about them, I have placed that in the chat for you to um, get to know um, who the original people here and the um, people that continue to steward these lands. Um, I encourage you to go ahead and check that out. Um, donate to their website. Um, you can also um, hear stories and learn more on uh, a piece that WHYY um, created. And thank you for joining us. Okay, so tonight's speaker that we have with us is Alex Palma. Hi, Alex. Hi, hey guys. Um, he's the assistant director of the Carpenters Company of the City and County of Philadelphia, the Carpenters Company for short. Uh, the company maintains a historic site, Carpenters Hall, and a small archive. Um, Alex has held his post at Carpenters Hall for nearly five years. Prior, Alex cut his teeth in the Philly history scene by working various projects and short-term or part-time archives and or public history jobs around the city, including the Union League of Philadelphia, Christ Church Preservation Trust, the LaSalle University Archives. Um, sorry about that. Um, Laurel Hill Cemetery and elsewhere. Alex has judged for uh, National History Day since um, 2017 and um, Alex also serves as vice chair to the Delaware Valley Archivist Group. Congratulations. <laughs> and as a member at large to the Museum Council of Greater Philadelphia, Alex is also on the organizing committee of archives for Black Lives in Philadelphia. So with that, I want to welcome Alex to the Center for Art and Wood for tonight's object lesson. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, we have kind of a three camera uh, setup tonight. So if I seem a little confused as we get started, it's only because uh, my face is all over everything. Um, so uh, I wanted to thank Katie um, and the staff here at the Center for Art and Wood for inviting me and for helping me over the last two weeks um, do research on tonight's topic. Um, tonight's topic is uh, a very local uh, Philadelphia oriented um, subject. And that is, uh, the, the, tonight's topic is concerned with the archives of the John Grass Wood Turning Company. Um, and so I guess if we start the PowerPoint, it would be a good time. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm excited personally to give this talk uh, tonight uh, because my institution, the Carpenters Company, has a long history of being involved with uh, Philadelphia's trades. Obviously, it's, um, you know, being a hall for carpenters, as you might imagine. Uh, we, the Carpenters Company, are the oldest continually operating trade guild in Philadelphia. And so we have a long history, a long relationship with the uh, different aspects of uh, Philadelphia trades work. Um, not only because of our museum collections, but because of our institutional operating uh, modus operandi. <laughs> so, uh, John Grass, um, next slide, I guess. The John Grass wood turning shop uh, was founded in Philadelphia in 1863 in what is now considered Old City Philadelphia. Um, John Grass himself emigrated here in 1853 uh, 10 years before founding his shop. Uh, he emigrated here at the age of 15 from Bavaria, which today is in Germany. Um, and 
uh, if you do the math, that means that he was only 25 years old when he started his shop. So, um, yeah. Oh, wait, can you go back one slide? Oh, yes. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, so the original shop of the location, uh, the original location of his shop is unknown. Um, but uh, he, we do know that after moving a bunch of times, this, uh, the, the wood turning company ended up at 125 North 2nd Street, which is only a couple blocks from here. Uh, okay, now next slide. Um, in 1911, uh, John Grass incorporated his shop uh, with a bunch of fellow uh, industrialists um, and minted it the John Grass Wood Turning Company. Um, and so uh, throughout his life, uh, John Grass works tirelessly to expand his company and to, um, ex you know, do more and more different kinds of operations, do more and more different kinds of wood turning. Um, and he eventually is able to incorporate it into, um, I guess, what today would be like the rough equivalent of an LLC. In 1916, uh, the John Grass uh, Wood Turning Company moves to 146 North 2nd Street, which is the building that it would occupy until its closure. Um, however, next slide. John Grass would not live to see it move to its uh, final location because he died in 1914. Um, and at which point the company was taken over by the Bauer family, right? So um, the Bauer family was part of uh, that incorporation that the John Grass company went through in 1911. Um, and so really for the uh, vast majority of uh, the John Grass Company's operations, it was run by the Bauer family. Um, so the Bauer family passed the John, uh, John Grass Wood Turning Company down generation to generation to generation um, until it finally closed, uh, until the shop finally closed in 2003. Next slide. Um, so here is the final uh, Bauer to have operated the John Grass Company shop. Um, he reincorporated the uh, uh, wood grass, uh, John Grass uh, Wood Turning Company as Bauer Incorporated in 1989, but operated out of the same building. Um, and finally, uh, Lou having no um, heirs to continue um, the uh, trade, I guess, um, closed the shop in 2003. So as you can see, it's Lou Bauer III. Um, Lou Bauer the first was involved in the original um, incorporation of of the John Grass Wood Turning Company in 1911. Um, so it was really quite the family business. Now, so after the shop closed, uh, the Bauer family continued to own the building. Um, and around 2008, uh, the Wood Turning Center, which um, is would later become the Center for Art and Wood attempted to acquire the building, um, but was unable to and chose not to. Um, however, uh, with partner, uh, by partnering with the local carpenters union, most of the equipment and artifacts in the shop were saved. Um, I believe that the facade of the wood turning company still exists, right? Um, the building? Of John Grass? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, yes. Um, all right, next slide. So um, the, the reason that the John Grass uh, Wood Turning Company <clears throat> was important, is important, is because it operated in a larger context in Philadelphia. So uh, throughout the 19th century and into the early 20th century, um, Philadelphia um, kind of fell into and adopted this moniker of the workshop of the world. Um, so, you know, you have to imagine, you know, this is the height of the Industrial Revolution. A lot of um, America's cities are industrializing very rapidly, but um, Philadelphia was particularly well positioned to be um, a strong uh, center for industry because of the two rivers, uh, the Delaware and the Schuylkill, um, because of its proximity to larger urban centers like Baltimore and uh, New York. Um, and also uh, because it was um, recipient to uh, several, several waves of different immigrant groups throughout that time period. Um, Philadelphia's Industrial Revolution is also unique compared to the Industrial Revolution of other cities 
like New York or Baltimore, uh, because during this period, um, Philadelphia, Philadelphia's sort of blossoming trade community uh, was mostly made up of small and mid-sized workshops. Um, and that was definitely not the case uh, in other large industrial centers like New York or Massachusetts, or Boston, uh, well, Lowell, Massachusetts, or Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, amongst these small shops um, and mid-sized shops were, was a great diversity of different kinds of trades. Um, so you had woodworking, leatherworking, metalworking, um, food production, alcohol production, shipbuilding, shipping. Um, and uh, yeah, so Philadelphia in this period um, was highly industrial um, and highly productive. It was sort of a, also a trade center. Um, so, but that identity waned in the 20th century um, until Old City particularly becomes more and more of a tourist uh, area as it is today. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, so we have some photos here that were done by Jet Lowe um, after uh, the Bowers closed the shop in the early aughts. Um, and so you can see, you know, when it closed, it, it was uh, very much still a wood turning shop. It looks very retro. Um, I wish I could have ever seen the inside um, in real life, you know, when it was like this, but alas. Um, okay, next screen. This is uh, what the shop looked like when it was closed. Um, as you can see, it's, uh, you know, kind of a storefront. Um, all right, next one. And uh, so here are some objects. Before I get to the archives, I just want to show off some photos uh, that um, of objects in the Center for Art and Woods collection um, that were fabricated by the John Grass Company. Right, so this is a rolling pin, right? And then this is kind of one of the classic types of objects you would have made in a wood turning shop um, because, I mean, it just screams uh, wood turning in that <laughs> it's so round, it's so cylindrical. Um, all right, next one. This, this one's a little bit more complicated. This is the collection plate that was made for a Catholic church. Um, it, I uh, hope that you all in the audience someday have the opportunity to see this collection plate in real life because it's gorgeous. It's really beautiful. Um, okay, next slide. And uh, finally, uh, something that the John Grass Company was well known for making was police batons. Um, so again, very cylindrical, very round. This is like the perfect kind of object that you would have made on a, a lathe. Um, and so this is like the sort of stuff that Throughout its history, the John Grass Company was well known for making. It was uh, prized not only by Philadelphia's different institutions, but by architecture firms, preservation firms, window railing companies, you know, all sorts of different subcontractor groups um, often sought out the John Grass Company, like in the Delaware Valley area for these types of items. Um, and they more or less used the same techniques to make these items throughout their history. Um, all right, next slide. So um, tonight, I'm gonna to show you some choice uh, items from the archives here, the John Grass archives here at the Center for Art and Wood. Um, and it kind of leads one to ask the question, what are the point of archives at all, um, but specifically in the context of something like this, uh, a, a wood turning shop that no longer exists, um, was primarily involved in a trade, um, et cetera, et cetera. So like, not only is this an organization that no longer exists, but it's also an organization that is not typically the kind of organization that would you would think uh, would produce in archives, right? Um, so most archives are associated with academic setting or, or perhaps a religious setting or any kind of like large institutional um, what have you. Um, but this is an example uh, of what we in the biz, I guess you can say, would call a business archives. Um, so in general, here, here we have on this slide some definitional things. And archives um, 
is an, a group of inactive records um, that belong or uh, that belong or document an institution, organization, group, or individual, right? Um, their main value in general, uh, and their main value to all sorts of different groups, but in general, uh, is that they provide evidence of the operations or activities of an entity, right? And that, that has all sorts of connotations. That has um, historical connotations, obviously, if you're a historian or an academic. Um, it has legal connotations, right? Um, if this was an active business, it could even have marketing connotations or purposes. Um, and so archives are, are really like a rich um, substance uh, that can be used by all sorts of different groups um, for all sorts of different purposes. Um, now, it's important to recognize that uh, the practice of maintaining an archives is not itself a neutral practice, right? Um, so uh, archives, I think in the past have often been seen as like this like inherently objective thing, right? It's like, you know, uh, paper doesn't lie, you know, this is the evidence, whatever. And while archives do uh, are a kind of evidence, um, they're not like so rigorous that they are immune from the interpretation of the archivists or the people that were saving the records or the way that even that the archives are arranged, um, like have all sorts of value judgments and stuff like kind of baked into that. Um, however, when working with archives, um, something that makes them really interesting to work with is the fact that um, archival materials generally are not themselves interpretive. Um, and what I mean by that is that these papers and things um, do not like tell me a second or secondary source sort of story, right? So these are like by definition, like primary source type materials. Um, and so uh, with that all understood, we will go to the next slide and start looking at some of these. Um, so for those of you at home, I have a, a series of slides that show the kinds of things I want to show off. So, you know, my kind of lousy uh, webcam here doesn't have to struggle to get good details. Um, but I'm going to show off the stuff anyway, um, just so I can show you it's like a real thing. And um, so if you've never worked with an archives before, um, you know, you, you, if you, if you go and book a research appointment at an archives, which I encourage you to do, uh, I encourage everybody to work with archives at least a little bit in their lives, um, you know, uh, obviously handle the documents with care. Um, but one big misnomer or maybe uh, object of debate often in archives is whether or not they, uh, they should be handled with gloves. Um, generally, it's thought that papers should not be handled with gloves because they increase your risk of ripping. Um, you know, papers and such. Um, but what I want to show you all tonight um, is uh, what archives can do and what they can demonstrate and what you can learn from them uh, for all sorts of different purposes. So this uh, is a 1936 time book uh, that was used at the John Grass Company. Um, and it was used by workers to um, keep track of their hours, keep track of their wages, uh, see who's on shift when. Uh, go on, next slide. Um, and you can see here in the front cover, um, it, it has the date, right? So you can see that this is um, concerned with the activity of a particular point in time. Um, and it has a stamp of the wood turning company there. Next slide. And so uh, something I think is really interesting about this book is that they have printed a table of wages. Um, so you can see what the standard wages would have been for this kind of work in that era. And that's really, really um, good information for a historical researcher to have, um, just because, you know, if you're doing research about trades in Philadelphia, for example, you can compare the wages that people working at this company might make compared to another company, compared to a different trade, what have you. Um, all right, next slide. Okay, so this is a good example of one of the average pages in the wage book. And as you can see, um, they get a little bit cluttered, right? Um, because again, the, this was an active document that 
people would have scribbled on, people would have kind of filled out in haste. Um, but you can see here the hours per week, the rate of pay, and then the final weekly pay for different people. So this week, it looks like on average, everybody worked 35 hours at 50 cents an hour for a final total of $17 and 50 cents a week. And so, you know, if you go through this page by page, you can see who's working when, who starts the job when, whatever. You can see who's been there longer. You can see who's making more than other people. You, and so this would be great if you are a genealogist, maybe doing research on a relative, or um, if you're comparing, you know, again, the rates of pay between different organizations or different businesses, whatever. Um, all right, next slide. Uh, and so this is just another example of how busy this book can get. And, and then so, you know, when you're working with archives in general, you know, you have to kind of recognize that they're not always going to tell you right away what the answer to anything is. You kind of have to fight them, <laughs> right? And so like these can be different, you know, this stuff can be difficult to read. Um, words might mean different things than they do now. Numbers might mean different things. Um, so for example, it would be easy to flip through this and assume that these guys are making $2,000 a week because they don't use periods in the, uh, in, in, in the, in the monetary counting there. Um, what's also really interesting is that week to week in this book, um, the, the guys uh, work different amounts of time. Um, and so you can kind of start to get a sense of when is crunch time, when isn't it crunch time, what's the busy season, what's not. Um, and so that's really cool. Next slide. All right, so I'm gonna pull up the next thing here. Um, and it's gonna take me a second just because I have to kind of sift to it. Um, well, this is also the beauty of archives. Is you have to sift. Yeah, yeah you do it's shift. Yeah, very there's a lot of sifting. <laughs> um, all right, so this is a folder um, addressed to the John Grass Company um, by uh, from the United States Department of the Interior. Um, and so it's open already, and I will pull out the documents in a second. Um, however, go to the next slide real quick. Um, this slide and the last slide show you that you know when you're working with archives and you're dealing with things that are um, in uh, envelopes, the envelopes themselves are often um, great, great objects to look at in terms of learning things about what you're looking at. So here, you know, obviously we, we know that this is um, a work order mailed from the mailed to the John Grass Company from the United States Department of Interior. Um, from the National Park Service, as you saw in the earlier slide. Um, and the contact at the Park Service for this is Barb Murphy, as you can is there see. Postage? Um, there is postage. So again, by looking at the postage, you can get um, the date, right? And uh, postmark Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, right? And so you can really learn a lot of stuff just by looking at the envelope. All right, next slide. All right, so again, a very banal looking um, sort of bureaucratic paper here, right? But this is a work order from the National Park Service to the John Grass Woodturning Company. And what's often very interesting about this stuff is the kinds of things that you find on old bureaucratic type documents like this, right? So like here, you can see, um, you know, like again, the contacts. Um, you can see here that uh, they classify this as a small business um, and that they have a couple of other co uh, co uh, categories that they care about, right? Which is interesting because this is, I think, 1991. Um, and yeah, I mean, these, these types of everyday documents really like say a lot about what, and so even here you can see how much they paid. Uh, if you flip through it, you can see terms and conditions and what have you. Um, next slide. And what we find uh, going through these documents is that this is actually a work order for lamp posts in um, Independence National Historical Park. 
um, which is the neighborhood that we're in right, well, adjacent to the neighborhood that we're in right now. Um, so if you've been to Old City Philadelphia, you can see uh, this handiwork basically all over the place. Um, and so here, I'll show you. Um, this is a CAD drawing that of, of the wooden posts that they were presented with um, and sort of asked to fabricate. Uh, next slide. And so something that I uh, love to look for when I work with archives is actually um, stains and tears and blemishes or food stains, um, annotations, scribbles, things that aren't supposed to be there. And so because this is um, a document from a wood turning shop, I think it's great that a lot, <laughs> ironically, it's great that a lot of these documents have like wood stain on them, mm -hmm. right? So like you can see here that somebody probably had a gloved hand and they just like were looking at this while they were turning a lathe. And there's a lot of a lot of things um, amongst these papers that are like this. Next slide, please. And so here again, it's a great a great example of how like a little typo, a little blemish can tell kind of a nice little story, right? So if you look closely, I want to try to find this to show you. Uh, oh, here we go. You can see that on the work order, they kind of walked it down, right? So they started off with some unknown number there that they boxed out and then they crossed it out and put 40, 40 lathe turned laminated Western red cedar lampposts. And then they crossed that out and put 25. Um, and so like, you know, it, there's a process that <laughs> happened here. That's a real simple, interesting, pro you know, you can learn a lot by these little things. Um, all right, next slide. And so here's one of the lampposts outside my building here at Carpenter's Hall. That this is one of these red cedar lampposts. Okay. Yeah. So it, you know, again, it's an example of how a couple simple little documents can correspond to real life, real world things in a, in a real meaningful way. Um, okay, next slide. Oh yeah, sure. If you don't mind, I'll put them up. All right, I'm gonna have to sift a little bit more to get to these guys. Doing good on time. <laughs> All right, okay, I'll put that back. And then we're going to look at something that's a little bit more typical than, than what we've been looking at so far. Sorry for the delay. I would tell a joke if I had one. <laughs> Alas, I am the joke. Here we go. All right, this is the next thing I want to show off. So here again, this is a pretty typical, and I selected this because it's a pretty typical uh, uh, folder of purchase orders um, from just before uh, the um, John Grass Wood Turning Company closed. And I think this is great because I think that this folder is really interesting because it shows off uh, something that, that's pretty archetypical throughout uh, this collection in general. So this first thing that I, I think is just great is um, a, a blueprint or a mock-up of a, a plaque that the John Grass Company was hired to do. Um, and one of the workers there drew a blueprint for it on a manila folder. And it's, it's, to me, it's such a simple um, thing, honestly. It's not obviously a super important historical object uh, in the grand scheme of things, but it does a lot to give you a, a sense of the flavor, um, a sense of the, what it was like to work at this company. You know, you know there's all sorts of things scribbled on all, all sorts of um, documents and such, uh, papers scribbled onto, discarded pieces of ads, whatever. Um, all right, next slide, please. And so, oh yeah, 
this is another example of, of something I think is really interesting. Um, so this is a drawing of a coffee table. Um, here we go. It's pretty intricate. But again, this is what I mean, uh, something that is uh, indicative of, of the John Grass archives in general that show that, this is, that these are collections from a um, real life working wood shop is that there is a splatter of wood stain on this page. And then in this image here, you can see uh, another example from another folder of actually lacquer that had been sprayed across a piece of paper. Um, and I mean, it's just a very interesting sort of living experience. Next slide, please. Okay, yeah, and this, so this is just evidence that this is of a coffee table. Again, the price, how many, interesting stuff. Next slide. Oh yeah, and so I picked this one out because it's an example of one of the challenges you get in archives is that not all paper is printed to be in a folder. And so this is a blueprint, literally a blueprint, uh, that's had to have been folded up in order to fit in the archival, archival context here. Um, so yeah, the post. And so there's lots of drawings like this in the collections. Next slide. Oh yeah, so this is another uh, sort of archetypical work order or a note that's been scribbled to um, Lou, who at the time was the owner of the John Grass Company in the early 2000s. Lou the first. Um, now this one's actually Lou the third. He would have been the last one. Uh, but uh, he, you know, again, it's just a little note that asks for, um, you know, a type of uh, object to be made. And there's a lot to learn here. There's a lot to, uh, what's the word? In these little details, you, you really learn a lot about how this organization ran, and how this business ran. Um, okay, next slide. Oh yeah, and again, this is another example of how um, different uh, little things can be pretty indicative uh, in the archives themselves. Um, so this is, this uh, image on the left is a just a shipping label and a mailing label. And in, in the grand scheme of history, it tells you a lot of who's ordering this stuff, who's uh, receiving it, what kinds of companies are you know, ordering work to be done. And I think this you know, in particular is pretty interesting. Next slide. Um, and this is just uh, one more example of like the kinds of improvised drawings they would do on different kinds of materials. So this looks like it was drawn on maybe an old cardstock advertisement sign and stapled together. Uh, next slide shows, you, shows uh, our digital audience the extent of this particular drawing. So this is a drawing of, of, a, um, of a railing, I think. Um, and it's, it's quite long and it's drawn, drawn on cardstock that's stapled together. So it, it's interesting to me because it really indicates that um, this wood turning shop was pretty small throughout its existence, family owned, because the kinds of drawings that they did by the workers who worked there are on all sorts of improvised materials. Um, and like you really get, you can almost feel yourself in the shop while going through this stuff. Now I love this one too, because it's a business card that's been stapled to the, um, this particular drawing, this is Butch in quotes. So, you know, something that's fascinating to me about archives in general is like how these little traces of things, after a while, if you look at them the right way and think about them the right way, really start to add up into a cogent story. Um, and so the last thing I want to show tonight, which again will take some sifting to get through, is um, a document from the uh, constitution of the John Grass Company in 1911. And it was just no smoking shop. <laughs> I love this. I love this. Look at the material. That's it's just paper. It's paper. Yeah. And so 
uh, you can imagine, like at a wood turning shop, uh, fire could be pretty disastrous. And um, if anything, the no smoking signs in this era are more severe than the no smoking signs you see then, uh, now, because they say, like, look at this guilt trip. It's right. really phenomenal. <laughs> a fire in this building may put every man out of work, guard the property against fire, and protect your job. What a note, huh? Can you imagine walking in and seeing that every day? Um, all right, next slide. And what I think is really interesting about this is besides the text, you can tell that this sign was up for a long time in the shop. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was up up until the day that the shop closed um, because it's been, you can notice that it's been hung multiple times. There's different points of connection here. Uh, and next slide, please. You can see all sorts of stains on the slide, uh, on the sign. Again, wood stain, lacquer, dust. Even, even after being in an archives for like 10 years here, there's still a good amount of dust on this dirt. Um, next slide, please. And you can see there's a significant tear on the sign um, that indicates maybe somebody had brushed against it with a um, maybe piece of wood or a tool. Um, and you know these these are trivial details; they really are, um, but they tell a lot. They say a lot uh, in the sum total about this organization, about this business, and how it ran, and how long it's been around, and what kind of work was being done around these uh, around these papers. Um, and yeah, so oh, next slide, please. Oh, yep, and that's it. So um, I, we do have a bunch of time for questions. Um, but, uh, you know, I hope overall this presentation has uh, encouraged you guys um, to seek out archives related to topics you're interested in, because if there's a topic you're interested in, I guarantee that there's an archive somewhere that collects materials about it. Biking, science, you know, churches of all kinds have archives. And <laughs> think of a topic, just plenty of film archives um photography archives art um and yeah you know there there are stories that you can find um in 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 uh, archival collections that you really can't find elsewhere uh, you get you get a peek into people's lives people's daily lives people's working lives people's domestic lives um and yeah i mean i find it uh, enrapturing um, the other insight that I think, and I'll, I'll end on a, on a note that you might not have expected, but I think that um, archives teach us also um, how to be a little uh, smarter with our data and uh, identity kind of information. Um, you know, because you know, we live in a time of unprecedented identity theft and hacking and what have you. Uh, you can imagine if we can infer this much just from you know, a, a passing glance at, you know, decades old documents, uh, you can only imagine what random people can infer about your life by going through your trash. Um, so, you know, shredder is like 20 bucks at Staples. If you don't, if, if you don't want something to be found out, shred it. Um, and with that, I'll open it up to questions. Um, we have a bunch of people in the chat. We have couple people here right now so if anybody has anything they're keeping yeah what's up um i have a couple questions are first of all these are housed here these archives yep they're actually okay. right behind key is it hard to um you know it sounds like you can just go and look up an archive or ask or make an appointment or whatever but is it is it restrictive to be able to do something like that no it really depends on the archive like maybe they come with you and kind of handle it with you or yeah so it depends on the archive it depends on the types of materials that an archive has You'll almost always be supervised. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, if you're not being supervised, I would be right, right. hesitant to recommend that place. Um, but certain places have like a registration process that you have to go to. Um, by and large, in my experience, most archives are just happy to have people come by. So if you email and say, hey, I'm interested in this topic or I'm doing research on this, they'll you know, say, come on by, this is what I'm hearing. Um, in a lot of cases, uh, if you're writing to an archive that's far away, um, you can even ask the archivist to look stuff up for you. Um, you know, their time, you know, depending. 
Um, but yeah, it really varies from place to place. Most places that have an archives will have a sort of uh, rule uh, online. Hi guys, how you doing? We're a little late. That's okay. Hey. It's, but, it's wood turning. Is, is that the is that the the it's the word wood turning is what the shops are are called. That's a typical. I've I've never heard of that. Oh yeah, well so there's a, a distinction that I've um, grown to learn about between wood turning and carpentry, mm -hmm. right? So wood turning is based on the lathe, uh -huh. which is a circular, brr, 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 brr. Right. and um, there are cuts that are made like on that lathe to kind of, it's almost like a potter's wheel, but it would. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's actually um, a, a lot of really great wood lathe turned art in this museum um, that demonstrates like the capacity of lathe turning. I'm sure Katie can speak to that more yes, than I can. Yes, and, and actually I think Albert is on this. Yes, he is. So. Um, the Center for Art and Wood grew out of a series of symposiums and workshops that Albert um, put on and wanted to elevate the art of wood turning and it turned into a museum and most of our collection is wood turned objects. Okay. Um, in 2011 we rebranded to the Center for Art and Wood. Um, and that allowed us to bring into our collection, not only wood turned objects, but furniture, sculpture, various craft items. Um, so. Like, so carpentry also included. Well, so carpentry is a little different mm -hmm. often in that it opens up a variety of different other tools, saws, axes, uh -huh. whatever. Um, and also, uh, tends to entail things that aren't as fine detailed. Now, I, I could be wrong on that, but like carpentry tends to look at furniture or, or tends to be concerned with buildings. Buildings, yeah. yeah. Um, so for us, Carpenters Hall, we're specifically the building kind of mm -hmm. carpenters. Um, so it's, it's interesting how wide a variety woodworking really can entail, yeah. I have a question for you. Yeah. We're talking about archives and archival objects. And uh, this is all physical archives. Yes. We're in an era now where most of our information is digital. Mm -hmm. So as we move forward, is there a possibility of our history of our everyday lives disappeared. Well, so it's interesting because um, uh, the, the, the problem of digital archives or the topic of the digital archives um, is, is a, it's a realm that's growing rapidly. Um, there are digital archives that exist. There are internet archives that exist. Um, perhaps the, the, the most commonly used digital archive in the world is the Wayback Machine on the Internet Archive. Um, the Wayback Machine, it's, it's a website that you can go look at um, old and non-existent websites with. So, have you, you know, it, it's a really interesting website actually. Um, so uh, digital archives uh, are sort of emerging on the scene more and more. Um, but there's a lot of problems in them, uh, not in them, or with, there's a lot of issues. There's a lot, not in a bad way, but like there's a lot of things that have to be figured out in that realm that, you know, really smart people, uh, really accomplished and uh, awesome archivists are working on now um, that like analog archives don't often have to think about, right? So because of that, um, digital archives are often more expensive, um, often a little bit more finicky, uh, than analog archives. That's not to say that they don't exist. There are tons of them, and there's tons of digital archives that do great work. Um, but there's uh, issues of format, right? So, for example, um, the file formats that are commonly used today either didn't exist 10 years ago or 15 years ago, or the file formats that were popular back then are not used much now and are difficult to read on contemporary computers. Um, so, um, institutions that are real heavy into digital archiving um, often need to uh, use emulators or use different kinds of uh, methods to make those older digital archives accessible, objects accessible. Um, 
Now, so there's also a, a distinction too in um, like sort of digital archives work between born digital materials, uh, which is like emails or Word documents or what have you, and like digitized uh, items. So like scanned photos, for example, are like a form of digital archives that like were originally analog, right? Um, and so these types of different types of materials have different needs and different purposes and like are accessed in different ways. Um, so the, the whole topic of digital archives in general is a huge realm um, that deserves a lot of thought and gets a lot of thought. And that'll be my next like, TED talk, I guess. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, so that's to say all, all over, uh, overall, that um, in the future, our lives will still be documented in an archival setting. Um, but uh, the history as it's lower, the, the archives will look different in that the materials from this era will be different than the materials of even 20 years ago, as you see here. Have you heard of um, space, the Athenaeum? Yeah, 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 the library, the special collections library. Oh, yeah. It's fabulous um, library and museum. I know a lot of the work they do there. Mm -hmm. is preserving uh, all documents that are falling apart. And oh, yeah. You know, it's, it's amazing. It's like, yeah, well, so the, there's a lot of really great work that um, places like the Athenaeum uh, do. There's another institution that does similar work of a different kind. <laughs> what a misnomer sentence. But the Conservation Center in Philadelphia also does work similar to that. Um, the Conservation Center is about stabilizing um, damaged archival level materials. Whereas the Athenaeum, there's a lot of digitizing work. So like the Athenaeum has a huge flatbed scanner. I use that scanner for my artwork. Oh, really? Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Great yeah, the scanner is about the size of this table. Um, and it's one of the only ones that big in the city. Um, and so uh, they, their approach often is that, so that is what we would call in the archives or digitizing, or digitizing an object. And you can imagine um, how that's different to a digital object that was created, like maybe a digital uh, piece of art or a 3D model or something, which was born digital, um, that was created on, an online, uh, or on a computer program. And yeah, so there, there's multiple fashion things, yeah. So we have um, Ms. Shea would like to ask a question. Oh, sure, go ahead. Hopefully I can, uh, ooh, let me turn you, uh, you're, Ms. Muted. Shea, you're muted. I'm sorry to say. Okay, um, your your conversation about digital um, and digitizing things reminds me of a discussion I had with Karen, the registrar at the center um, over the summer as I was working on my um, master's thesis. I graduated from UART in August. I was um, museum studies um, pro from their museum studies program. And I, my thesis was on how um, digital technology has changed in the wake of COVID-19 and we got into a discussion about there's a shelf of VHS tapes over on the side oh, and, yeah, it's over there. Yeah. and there was like this they haven't figured out in a, a cost-effective way of digitizing all those VHS tapes from like the first uh symposia and uh, workshops and things that eventually became the center and like different events that were hosted in when the center was uh, was in um, Albert Lacoste, um, who's the founder, it was in his home for a good number of years. So uh, I know part of the digital archives would be like, you know, putting making those VH tapes, uh, converting them into a format that can be accessed on current and future devices. And also I had a question about the, the physical archives, those papers and things like that. How are they maintained? Because a lot of those work orders and signs are not printed on paper that was designed to stand the test of time. Mm -hmm. So how are they, um, how are they being preserved so that they can be um, part of archives for lo the long haul? Because like, I know those work orders, they're printed on like very thin paper, kind of like newsprint. 
type of paper, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. They're, they're really on all sorts of kinds of paper. They're kind of yeah, exactly. Really like yeah. their car. I saw some stuff on Manila folders and cardstock and uh, all sorts of different paper. And those, not all papers are made, you know, of archival are treated to be archival. Yeah. Um, so those are two fabulous questions. I'll just say off off the bat. Um, and I do want to say um, VHS tapes in particular are on a high priority list um, amongst most digital archivists to preserve or to digitize um, because they are very fragile. Um, VHS tapes and, and film in general is very fragile. Um, and so there, there is um, an estimated date in the future. And I think most people put it at like 2040 or 2050 um, where uh, archivists and scientists in general as a field um, have predicted uh, that by this certain date, and I forget the date off the top of my head, um, by this particular date, all existing film media will no longer work just oh. because of the uh, physical forces that work. And all that. Yeah. Um, and which is a pretty scary date because that puts a lot of pressure <laughs> and on uh, the institution that have these sorts of tapes and such um, to get them digitized. Um, and the other thing that you bring up that I think is great, uh, I'll expand on it a little bit, is um, the fact that uh, digitizing uh, or even just having digital archives at all um, creates, uh, it, 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 it makes the archives themselves much more accessible um, because researchers from around the world can go on a website to access the digital archives. Um, the downside, uh, as I mentioned before, um, to digitizing archives or maintaining digital archives or digitizing analog object, uh, analog, analog materials is the cost. Um, VHS tapes are very costly to digitize. Um, even scanning paper documents is very costly. Um, now to answer your question, uh, Nishé, about um, how these materials are preserved, um, the, uh, the answer is that all archives and all preservation work is sort of a, a negotiated decay, right? So physics, you know, chemicals, all this stuff is still like working forces on these documents. It's just that archives um, provide an environment that's the best or at least the better um, possible environment um, for these materials, right? So these uh, documents are uh, separated in acid-free mineral folders from each other. Um, and so what that does is that it creates mini environments between the different uh, layers, if you like, um, because if all these documents were stacked on top of each other, there would be an exchange of acid throughout all the papers that would cause them to decay much faster. Um, the other thing is that by keeping them in this museum quality building, that uh, has a relatively stable humidity, a relatively stable temperature, um, you are able to keep the papers at a climate that's better for them than if they are just in someone's house or in someone's attic or in a basement. Um, and so uh, with archives, often what you're kind of doing is the best you can <laughs> um, because there really isn't like a perfect thing. Um, there isn't a perfect action that you can take when you're archiving stuff. Um, and that goes for analog or digital archives, right? Um, because, uh, because of the physics of it, because of the funding limitations, you can only kind of do what's better as opposed to what's best. That's what I find anyway. That might be controversial for people. But um, so, yeah. Yeah, well, Nava just wrote in the text. Um, that digitizing archives isn't just the cost of digitizing the materials. It's also the significant cost of storing and hosting the digitized content. So that's also very true. The yeah. issue of storage. And then also you have to build out the interface, right? So there's often specialized um, interfaces that you have to like get consultants for and stuff to build the digital archives um space and it has to be maintained um and there's specialized databases you have to use and it's uh so like it's there are tons and tons of upsides to having 
uh, digitized materials and having a digital archive. Um, but there are so many costs and there's so much work that has to go into it that you, you know, anyone that maintains an archive has to kind of balance um, the commitment to digitizing uh, with their commitment to maintaining the analog materials. And a lot of times because of staffing, because of budget, because of um, the sort of, there, there is a primacy often to analog materials that's well deserved, I think, um, at least for now, at this time. <laughs> Well, I think we're Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to see if there was any other uh, comments. Yeah. I, I saw one other one before. So I just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. No, well, you know what? There's a recording yeah. too, so you guys can always catch that. Um, we're really thankful to have Alex join us this evening and um, dig deep into the John Grass archives, which is a, a fascinating collection that we house here at the Center for Art and Wood. Um, we invite all of you, if you'd like to reserve time in our research library to do so. Um, there's all kinds of things in here to explore, all things craft, design, um, and uh, we'd love to have you join us for our next event, which is next week. Um, we have our winter residency with Robert Ayosa. We're doing a gallery talk with him over at Next Fab North. And um, check out Carpenter Hall's um, website. They have some great upcoming um, events going on. And um, thank you. And Enjoy the weekend, guys. It's Friday. Happy Friday. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.